Hey guys. Okay, first off, I'm so sorry for getting the time wrong in the in the video card that I put up. Um, somehow I left a one in front of the two um, when I entered it in. But anyway, okay, that it is what it is. Sorry, guys. Anyway, we're here at, with one of my very, very, very favorite people on the planet. And I think he should be everyone's favorite person because he stands up for all the earthlings, not just the the dominant one that destroys everything. Um, so I have back with me today, author, activist, environmentalist, eco-philosopher, Derek Jensen. Welcome to the show again. Well, thanks so much for having me again. <laughs> You're very, very welcome. And so we are going to continue our discussion on the Bright Green Lies, the book that you're going to have out hopefully next year, right? It's next year. Am I wrong on that? Okay. Right? Next year? Yeah, it's it's out of the publisher right now. And if they don't take it, the book is timely enough that we'll probably just publish it ourselves. And Yes. Because um, it really needs to be out there to uh, inform public discourse about um, about just so much of the nonsense that's going on out there. And there's a lot right now, a lot, especially with the environmental movement, um, people like corporations, governments, politicians, lobbyists are using the environmental movement to push their agenda and to maybe make money off of it instead of actually do what's right for for the planet, for, for nature, for, for our species as well. So this is important to me. This like gets right to my heart and what I think about it. And I think people just want an easy answer and they want to just say, okay, problem solved. We'll just do the green new deal. That would be great. You know, then people have jobs and lives and, and, and you don't have to worry about saving the planet because you know, the politicians are doing that for us after that. Um, I, I, I personally, when I when I went back and I looked at all the details and and I tried to think back, what would you have to do to accomplish this? It it stressed me out a lot. I I started to think of all the destruction to the planet that would happen, for one, just all the materials, um, everything it would take to rebuild our entire infrastructure and change our our energy system uh, to renewables, and it it turned out to me that. Well, it seems to me that it would just be more destructive than it would be helpful to to our situation and in all the other beings on this planet that are already losing their lives on a daily basis. We're losing with 200 species a day, at least. And uh, what if they if they implemented these plans, it's only going to get worse. So we covered hydro, we've covered wind, we've co covered uh, solar. We've, we've covered nuclear. So we're going to move on from there and cover everything that's left over. Well, whatever we can that's left over, starting with um, bio biofuel and stuff like that. Uh, can you just start getting into that one? Yeah. And I don't remember if I said this before, but one of the most important pieces of understanding I got was from reading and then interviewing Robert J. Lipton. Uh, one of the things that he said is that before you can commit any mass atrocity, you have to convince yourself and others that what you're doing is in fact good. You have to have a claim to virtue. So, and he wrote that about the Nazis, that the Nazis would, you know, that from their own perspective, they were not committing genocide and mass murder. From their own perspective, they were purifying the Aryan race and defending themselves. And... You know, we can talk about this with the conquest of the Americas, where they were not, in fact, committing genocide, land theft, but were um, manifesting their destiny. And I mean, from their perspective, of course, in reality, the Nazis were committing mass murder and genocide, and the, the, the conquerors here have been committing land theft and genocide. And so we see the same thing today, that capitalists aren't killing the planet they are developing natural resources there always has to be a claim to virtue and back in the 90s uh 
the first time I applied this to the environment was I was I was asked by this little alternative newspaper to write an article about I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was basically about the argument that the Forest Service was using that um, in order to improve forest health, they had to cut down the trees because the trees were infected by fungus or beetles or something. And that was the first time I recognized that the Forest Service has used and continues to use various arguments for deforestation, not the Forest Service, the timber, yes, Forest Service, and also the timber industry, the government in general. So at one point they said you have to cut them down because they're, because they are sick and they will die if you don't cut them down. And then a couple of years later, it's like, well, they were sick and dying and now they're rotting and we need to not let the wood rot. So we need to do salvage timber sales, excuse to cut it down. Uh, a couple of years later, oh, the forests are going to burn, so we have to cut them down. It just, there's always an excuse. Um, one of the excuses they're trying to push in California right now is that uh, water levels and reservoirs are too low and forests hold water. And so they want to cut down the trees above the, 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 the reservoirs, above the dams, so that all the water will run into the dam of course, with a lot of sediment. It's just, it's, it's wow. The way to understand all this is to recognize that there is always this claim to virtue. And, and, and another way to think about this is this happens in our own lives too. I mean, I have, I have never once in my life been a jerk. I have, of course, in my life been a jerk, but <laughs> if I've been a jerk, I've had it fully rationalized. The other person deserved it. Otherwise I wouldn't have done it, you know? Right. Nobody ever goes, okay, I'm going to do this jerkish thing because I'm a jerk. It's, it's, the same thing applies on the political level. Um, we always have our behavior written by point, which brings us to biomass. That, you know, a lot of the climate change activists got really excited because so called renewable energy increased in uh, Germany from, you know, whatever year to whatever year. But most of that increase by actual amount of energy made was through what's called biomass. And biomass is either planting tree or planting a crop like corn and then converting that crop into fuel, or it is cutting down trees and burning them. And right. so this is just the latest claim to virtue is they're actually cutting down trees all over the world, putting them into uh, chipping the trees, um, drying them, and then uh, burning them to make electricity. And they're calling this green. And they're also calling it carbon neutral. And the reason they're calling it carbon neutral is that there's two arguments, basically. One is that the carbon was already sequestered back when the trees grew. And we're just releasing carbon that was already sequestered, which means that we're not actually putting the carbon in the air. That makes no sense. <laughs> they will also argue, and I'm not making this stuff up. This is, this is a real argument. They will argue that this is carbon neutral because the forest may grow back over the next 100 years or over the next 500 years. And as it grows back, it will sequester the carbon. Right. But what happens in the meantime? Well, there's a, yes, there's a bunch of problems with this. The first one is, can you imagine, and this is called, this is under legal definitions, this is called carbon neutral. So they're actually getting sort of green kudos for deforestation. The forest in the American Southeast right now, I believe there's nine or 12 or 17 or some number in there of mills that are running full time, chipping the forests of the American Southeast to send to the UK for green energy. Not making this stuff up. And um, can you imagine an accounting firm that said, our books are balanced because we spent money now and sometime over the next hundred years, we may get this money back. But that means our books are balanced right now. 
I mean, that's they, ridiculous. Absolutely would, ridiculous. Yes. They would go to prison. That 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 and that's the sort of accounting that takes place. We already talked about that with hydro, that mm. they count those as carbon neutral, even though um, they are called methane bombs. Um, this is something this culture does a lot, which is pretend that what we think about things is more important than the things themselves. So, yay, it's carbon neutral, we say, because legally it's been enshrined that deforestation is carbon neutral under these circumstances. But, of course, it's not. And, of course, this ignores all the beings who live in the forest. It ignores everything else. So this is, this is nonsense for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, one of them is that as forests age, they sequester more carbon as trees individually age, they sequester more carbon per year. And as the forest itself ages, it sequesters more carbon per year. So older forests sequester more. And so not only are they ignoring the, the forest may very well not grow back. They're ignoring all the beings who live in the forest. And they're also ignoring the fact that this causes great harm in the short term. And they're also ignoring all of that additional carbon that could have been sequestered for the years in between. And right. It's, it's, it's like a friend of mine, Owen Lloyd, recently said that, huh, how is it that those in power are getting really excited about planting trees everywhere, but they're not so excited about stopping clear cutting? Huh. I wonder why that is. <laughs> um, so biomass is... Oh, and I also just read this thing the other day. There was a study done in 2001, even. So, I mean, this has been known forever that, you know, like ethanol that they put in gasoline, mm -hmm. that's basically just a farm support program for corn farmers. It's not, it actually, and this makes, makes sense, it actually costs more energy to grow the corn and turn it into fuel than it does you get fuel back. It's actually a net energy loss. Right. And it's also horrible for your car, by the way, too. Uh, my husband's a mechanic, so he yeah. tells me this. It's like, don't, if you can, get the real the real stuff for a while. But I don't like using any of it. I'd rather not drive. I'd rather just stay home. In fact, I've been home for six weeks. I left my house once to go to the doctor. Other than that, I've been home. I don't like leaving home. I just wish we all could be home gardening like I've been the last six weeks. It's like, this is a perfect life. Um. Would that be nice if we could just do that? Sorry, I did not mean to interrupt you. <laughs> That's fine. So, so this is happening all over the world that deforestation has been labeled green and um, it's a complete travesty. Uh, let's see, what other, is there anything else you want to ask about biomass? Um, and if, I don't if, know. I mean, especially when you do biomass and then you ship it overseas. I mean, adding the transport of it. I mean, nobody considers transport in any of the calculations. Am I, am I up in the night on that? Because I think almost everything, no one considers transport for it. Or, well, the manufacturing, obviously, using the fossil fuels to, to produce it. But, but then there's always transport that is kind of important. Well, yeah, if you're transporting entire forest from the southeast across the ocean to the UK to burn them, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense environmentally either. Um, right. I don't know how much we talked about shipping. Did we talk about shipping before? I, I certainly hope so, but that's one of my big talking points on my channel. I talk a lot about shipping, transport, um, just basic, um, not living locally. I talk a lot about that on this channel. So. Well, it's one of the reasons that all of this stuff about one of the many reasons all this stuff about having a entirely renewable economy is nonsense that um, I interviewed someone about who's an expert on shipping on, on, on truck transportation, especially. And one of the points she made is that if you have a 60,000 pound payload on a semi, uh, it takes about, I think, 500 pounds of gas or something, 500 pounds of diesel to go uh, 600 miles. And to go that same distance with batteries would take 55,000 pounds of batteries, and which leaves you with a 5,000 pound payload, which makes the whole thing a, a complete waste of time. And that's not even to talk about 
um, ocean shipping or air transport. And I mean, if you look around, you know, we can we can talk about staying home, and I think staying home is a wonderful thing. We can talk about buying locally, but I don't remember the numbers on this, so I'm making up the numbers. But basically, anything you can see in your room was probably transported on a half dozen semis at one point or another. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lamp right there. Well, it's been transported on more than that because this lamp we had when I was a kid. And since since I was a kid, moved once, twice, three times, four times. So there's four semis right there that was, since we've owned it. Wow. And there are four, you know, tr truck transports. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a U-Haul or a, a trucking business. And before that, you know, who knows where the original, this thing's pottery, who knows where the original clay came from, who knows where the electronics came from, the mining. There were many, many trucks involved with this. And right. so it just is. There's a line I read in David Ehrenfeld's uh, Arrogance of Humanism a long, long time ago when he's talking about false solutions. And I interviewed him. And I said, so, you know, yeah, these solutions are false. But, you know, what's what's wrong with that? I mean, I was I was giving him a softball and uh -huh. he. He said, well, first off, lying is nasty. Second, and here's the point, it wastes time we don't have on solutions that won't work. Yes, thank you. And that's really the core of the whole bright green lies message. Is this all this stuff wastes time on, first off, it wastes time on solutions that won't work even for their stated goals of attempting to maintain industrial civilization. And second, it never asks the question, of whether industrial civilization is more important than life on earth. Right. We have to make nature primary. We the, have to. The natural world primary because we depend on it. It, it should be worshipped like a god. If, if we made that the most important thing, then then we wouldn't have been in this predicament to begin with. I agree. It's I mean it's it's and it's completely nuts that that you have to say that. Mm -hmm. It is. Self evidently <laughs> obvious that the source of all life is the earth. The problem is that one of the things that this culture has done is just like any abusive system, it's inserted itself between us and the source of life to make us dependent upon it. You know, just like an abuser will cut off all of um, their victim's social contacts to prevent the victim from having a support system to get away and mm -hmm. support to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, this culture has uh, inserted itself between us and the natural world. So that by now, I mean, if your experience is that your food comes from the grocery store and your water comes from a tap, you will, excuse me, defend to the death of the system that brings those to you because your life depends on it. On the other hand, if your food and water come from a land base and a river, you'll defend to the death of those because your life depends on it. But again, we've been made systematically dependent on the system. And that is one of the uh, functionally brilliant things of the system. So anyway, we have biomass. Is there anything else you want to ask about biomass? Um, ah, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. But I did want to ask you what your opinion is on the environmental movement in general. And Greta Thunberg, who's been really, really predominant in, in, in the scene right now, and what she said to... Um, the UN as far as um, oh, what did she say that something about she doesn't want to hear about the money you know the world is burning and all you can talk about is your is your money and and which the the fairy tale of eternal growth is what she said which was fabulous I was just wondering what you thought about that well obviously you have to be insane to think that you can have infinite growth on a finite planet a 16 year old is pointing that out to adults. And I think that's crazy. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's crazy that we have a system where people can say with a straight face that you can have infinite growth on a finite planet and that you can, yeah. that you can, but I think it's crazy that you can have people who say you can have mining on a planet and not kill it. I think it's crazy that you have people. Who say you can have industrialism and have a yeah. 
And you need to live in harmony with it or we will destroy it. But they just think it's too big. We can't destroy it. I, I just spent three hours in right wing hell the other the other day. And it was crazy. Like five people against me all saying that environmentalism is just crap. And and nothing's wrong with the planet. And, and one of them was a wildlife biologist. Well, there are wildlife um, biologists who... Uh, quite a few actually who go into this either go either go into this for the wrong reasons or through their education are taught to perceive non-humans as resources and not as human beings yeah right? that's exactly the way he looked at things exactly non-humans were resources i don't remember if we talked about this before but i interviewed Konstantin slobachikov who he's great he uh does research on prairie dogs did we talk about him no i deanna meyer Yes, but not him. Okay, so Khan Slobachikov has uh, studied prairie dogs for his entire life, and he um, he has discovered, he has been able to make a lexicon of some of their language, that if they will make some sound, they will, they will say one thing. If there is a hawk, they'll say something else. If there's a coyote, they'll say something else. If there's a human, they'll say something else. If there's a human with a gun, and... The way he did this is just by recording them and observing what's going on. Right. So if he sees a hawk and they see a hawk and they make a sound and then they do this five times, you can start to figure out that sound is, hey, there's a hawk. So and they have a communication system. Yeah, yeah. And the, the point is that he was never able to get money for this because because in order to get grants to study it, uh, what they wanted him to do was to bring prairie dogs into laboratories, deafen them, and then see if they were able to maintain their social contacts. And he refused to do that. He That's wasn't... just cruelty. That's not even... Of course it is. And one of the questions I asked him is, is it, is it reasonable to expect that someone who loves nature can go into try to get a PhD in conservation biology and emerge from that degree still loving nature. And he said it's really, really difficult because all through the conservation biology program, even conservation biology, which is basically the best way, even mm -hmm. conservation biology is going to teach you to objectify, to perceive them as resources, to be conserved, as opposed to other beings whose lives are other beings and communities with lives that are as valuable to them as yours as to you and mine as to me. And, you know, that's the, disturbing to me. I, that thought, I, I just don't, I don't grasp that concept. I never, ever, ever have. It's foreign to me, even though I'm surrounded by it. I feel like an outsider. Like I'm in Utah and uh, was raised by hunters. So this is hard for me. <laughs> it's really, I mean, it really, it's hard, been hard my entire life, but thank you for, for, for that. I mean, it, it's nice to meet people like you and realize that I'm not crazy. I'm not insane because I thought I was totally insane my whole entire life. I'm talking to animals, you know, it's, <laughs> well, anyway. that's, that's how we evolved. You know, we evolved in, uh, multi-species dynamic almost collaboration until the humans screwed it up right oh it has of course there's collaboration and this collaboration can be this is not saying that everything is all sweet and nice and everybody's always happy um you know salmon swimming up a stream some of them get killed by bears and um, they, uh, they, that's how they end up feeding the forest. And, you know, eventually the soil eats all of us. It's, it's not, you know, that, that's the price we pay for living in this wonderful, wonderful world is eventually we, we give our own lives to someone else. And exactly. Um, and I had a really hard time just with that concept of nature eating nature, you know, things eating things until I read this book, the Tao of Equus that talked about some studies showing how prey animals, when, when they've been captured by a predator, 
they they actually release endorphins where it's almost like a euphoric feeling and they don't actually feel the pain and that kind of helped me with that the um with that whole concept even though it's still it's still a difficult thing to picture and 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 talk about but i don't know it, well, I, it just seems like nature took care of of that to to make it easier you know what i mean i think for fast deaths that's right and i've had a couple experiences this way um i got in a terrible car wreck back in 1984 and i had a overturned load of semi load of uh plywood that overturned across the highway it was dark night in hell's canyon i didn't see didn't even have time to hit my brake so i had to go on 55. and the point is that for probably 30 seconds afterwards um i was fantasizing for 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 the for the first it, what i thought was wow why did somebody put a tarp across the highway oh they put a tarp across the highway because there was a, a landslide and there was a landslide so i have to avoid all the 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 uh rebel and the road and i'll pull over and now i'll go help whoever was hurt in the accident and then i heard a voice saying i can't move and then i realized that was my voice oh and wow so the point is that for 30 seconds i didn't know what was happening and this made me feel so much better well and actually don't worry about my health on this, but I passed out the other day. It was just a one-time deal, I think. Um, I hope so. Yeah, me too. Anyway, I was I was leaning over cleaning up kitty litter, and then the next thing I knew, I was sitting on the floor woozy, and I didn't know what was going on for like 30 seconds, and I was okay. The point is that I have absolutely no doubt that when a deer is running along and a mountain lion jumps out of a tree and bites it in the back of its neck, until it dies, I have no doubt that it's it's fantasy. It 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 still is, you know, running down the trail. It takes us a little while to figure out what's going on. I can't take that attitude quite so much when I think about uh, like there are some parasites who get inside grasshoppers or spiders or caterpillars or maggots on an open wound of a live animal. There's that too. Well, they're actually eating dead flesh. My mom had that when she was a little girl. I know we're getting off topic. Yeah, we totally are, but that's okay, because whatever. <laughs> when my mom was uh, three or four, she uh, was trying to help her mom with the dryer. This is back when the dryer was those rollers. You've seen pictures of those. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, she she was putting a handkerchief through the roller, and it caught. I have one. I have, yeah, I've seen it a few times. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> through the roller mm -hmm. oh uh you know did some damage and she uh she had some flesh that wouldn't fix and they were gonna have to cut off her arm and they said well let's try maggots and they put maggots on it and it uh cleaned up all the dead flesh cleaned up the infected flesh and everything was groovy wow anyway That's... yeah th there are times when uh Okay, those severe bacterial in, or virus, flesh-eating viruses or flesh-eating bacteria, yeah. that but, would suck really bad. I think no matter who you are, I think if you're an insect or a tree, because smallpox infects trees, there's a species, a species, I don't know how it works with viruses, but there's a strain or whatever they're called for viruses, smallpox that, that eats trees or does whatever viruses do to trees. Um, so yeah, it's, that, those would be a bit more problematical. But um, anyway, back to the original point. <laughs> um, so bright green lies. Uh, we've got we've got biomass. Um, I don't know how much we really have to talk about batteries. That that yeah, we talked about batteries pretty extensively. I think in the last one. Uh, so. Batteries. Uh, oh, so you you mentioned early on that you wanted to talk about permaculture. And before we talk about yeah. permaculture, I want to I want to. I mean, permaculture is great. I think localizing food systems is great. I'm saying nothing bad about them, but um, there are some studies where they've done the math and um, I have a friend who was very intensive about growing food in Portland on, I think it was a half acre or acre and recording, doing it as an experiment, recording everything 
all the inputs, all the everything they got out of it. Uh, they had a little fish pond. They had bees. They had chickens, and they had fruit trees, etc., etc., etc. And they were still not able, and they had either a half acre or acre, and they were still not able to grow enough food for both of them. And he then did the math, expanding this all throughout Portland. And basically, if you did really intensive in Portland, again, I don't really remember the numbers, but basically, you could have one quarter of the population if you weren't going to import food. And there was a, that was one person doing that study. And then there's, there was a, a larger scale study done of Seattle. And let me, let me try to find this. Um, and I can, so I can give you real numbers instead of making them up. Okay. Fabulous. Uh, okay. Uh, just so. still in resistance staff, a Gazar says, okay. <laughs> Thanks Gazar. Um, in 2014, the ports of Seattle and nearby Tacoma brought in more than 180 million tons of grain. The volume of other imports wasn't as similarly huge. 23 million tons of petroleum, 6.5 million tons of logs, 4 million tons of gypsum, 600 million tons of bulk cargo. Uh, okay, study. Uh, one University of Washington analysis found that if all homeowners in Seattle replaced their lawns with crops, in this case, not a nutritionally balanced diet, but plants most suited to the climate, the resulting harvest would provide 1% of the food needs of the city. Ripping out every street and planting on every rooftop with good sunlight would still provide only 21% of the city's food needs. The study estimated that leaving streets intact and simply ripping up all the grass in the city, not just yards, but also parks, medians, and so on, would only produce about 4% of the food requirement, a number they called a reasonable estimate of Seattle's, quote, maximum food produ crop production capacity. So the point here is that there's too many people to feed <laughs> and you can i mean a lot of these sort of new fake greens talk a lot about how cities are central to uh sustainability but that's physically impossible and it's been impossible from the beginning cities have required the importation of resources from the beginning they've required conquest since the beginning um and they simply cannot i mean when somebody says, well, let's make, oh, I, I just read this. It was some terrible, terrible writer said that if you want to look at the most sustainable place in the world, it's Manhattan. And I mean, this is <laughs> where, where do you get the bricks? Where do you get the wood? Where do you get the water? Where do you put your poop? In, in the case of New York, they put it down in Alabama now. Um, and they used to put it out in the ocean, but that's no longer allowed. So they ship it to, they pay Alabama to ship it down there. Um, wow. where, do you, where do you get the bricks I already mentioned where do you get the asphalt where do you get the glass where do you get the sand to make your skyscrapers where do you get any of this stuff obviously it all comes from somewhere and that's the thing somebody else already lives in that other place and right. one of the most important lines I ever read and this this has informed everything I've ever done is John Livingston in the fallacy of wildlife conservation talked about how there is no surplus in nature. And that's just true that any food I eat is food that someone else can't eat. And that and doesn't humans have eat, but it means that I can't pretend that it, that, that, that what I, that I can take sand from all over the world and that not have any effect somewhere else. We have this weird idea that food suddenly appears in the grocery store and that toilet paper suddenly appears in the grocery store and that, that, you know, your, the wood in your house suddenly appeared and didn't come from somewhere. And that I think they, they feel the same way about windmills and solar panels. People don't understand what it takes to get them there. It's like they, they, they skip that step in their head, like just okay, we could just switch all our power over to, to windmills and solar panels and, and hydro and that. And they don't, they don't go through the steps in their head of what it would take to get there and, and how massive, how massively that would take away from the, the nature to mine what's needed and to ship it and manufacture it. Um, 
and to put it in place. It's going to ruin the place mm. where you put it too. Yes. I yes. don't, I don't, it's like Christmas every day, you know, I mean, they still believe in Santa Claus, that Santa Claus is bringing the energy. Mm. It's, it's time to grow up and be adults about this. Um, <sighs> Well, they just want an easy, I think a lot of people, you know, they're really distraught. They're trying hard to accept what's going on. So they're trying to grasp at the easy answer, something that wouldn't require them to do a lot, um, wouldn't require a lot of sacrifices. And if just the biggie people, the, you know, the upper people, the people in charge would just take care of it with something like the Green New Deal or whatever, that everything will be just fine. Just elect this person implement the green new deal and everything's going to be just fine but i don't think it's going to be just fine for the other earthlings which means it won't be just fine for us in the long run i agree and part i don't know if i said this story before the story about my mom cleaning my room yes you have but say it again you yeah. can't say it enough when i was a kid you know i was i was uh you know i didn't clean my room my mom said clean your room i didn't do it she said clean your room i didn't do it and then finally, she said, if you don't clean it by dinner time, I'm going to clean it up and I'm going to throw away everything on the floor. And the point is that every cell in my body wishes that we would have a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living. But we're not going to. And so that was why I wrote my book Endgame is because I wanted to ask the question, if you don't believe there's going to be a voluntary transformation and you care about life on the planet, what does that mean for your strategy and your tactics? And the answer is we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because we don't talk about it. And the reason we don't talk about it is because we're all so busy pretending that we have hope, even though we really don't. We're all so busy that, that yes, that if we just do a Green New Deal, that things will be okay. And that's why I am so upset about all this stuff because, again, like David Ehrenfeld said, it wastes time we don't have on solutions that won't work and solutions that don't help the natural world. Oh, you did a recent interview. There's like four of you on there. Um, one of them was one of my very favorite people that I've had on a few times. And oh my gosh, I'm going blank at his name. Anna Meyer, uh, uh, Stephanie C. and Lear Key. Okay. There's another one though. The one that did a really great video that almost went viral about... Um, I don't know. Uh, what's his name? Will. Will. He He's a fellow Utah. He lives up in Heber. Um, Will. Um, <laughs> Will Fox. Yes. Yes. Him. There was a recent interview you did with him and a, a Jennifer, somebody that I don't recall the last name and somebody else. It was on, on. Oh, um, yeah, that was, that was uh, Max and Jennifer and Will. Yes, yes, that one. What were you guys talking about? The DEW? Uh, uh, decisive ecological warfare. That's, um, okay, pretend for a second that it was space aliens who had come down from outer space and were doing to the planet what the dominant culture is doing. Mm -hmm. If space aliens were doing to the planet what capitalism is doing, would we argue that things would be much better if the space aliens would just switch over from oil to wind to power their factories. No, we wouldn't. What we would do is we would destroy their infrastructure. We would destroy their capacity to wage war on the planet. And that would be a war situation. They're what? destroying us because it would be war at that point, and it should. Yeah, well, it has been a war. That's why one of my one of my CDs was called "Now This War Has Two Sides," is that war was declared on the natural world six or seven thousand years ago, and it's time that we acknowledge that, and it's time that we recognize that wars are won primarily not on battlefields themselves, but wars are won by destroying the enemy's capacity to wage war. World War II, yeah, World War II was won, yes, very much by the Russian army sacrificing millions and millions of human beings. It was also won by the British and allied bombing campaigns destroying the German capacity to wage war. 
the American Civil War was won by the North, yeah, partly Gettysburg, partly, you know, various battles, but really it was won by destroying the South's capacity to wage war. And I know it's really dangerous to talk this way, but we're talking yeah, okay. life on the planet. And again, if what I want people to do is to transfer their loyalty away from the powering of the industrial economy and toward the living planet. And then once you do that, your actions become much different. And I'm not saying that people need to go blow up oil refineries. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that people need to transfer their loyalty away from the dominant culture and to the natural world. And then you can protect the natural world in a multitude of ways through rhetoric, as you and I are doing, through um, filing timber sale appeals, through putting your body in between chainsaws and trees by being a lawyer who files things and takes them to the state Supreme court. It's there are, there are so many ways that you can resist, but the important thing is to make your resistance. Uh, you know, that's part of the problem with, with that's one of the things we say in bright green lies is early on Naomi Klein talks about how, uh, I'll find the exact quote. Uh, at one point, Naomi Klein says, uh, in film, this changes everything. I've been to more climate rallies than I can count, but the polar bears, they still don't do it for me. I wish them well, but if there's one thing I've learned, it's a stopping climate change isn't really about them. It's about us. And that That's right there. sad. And her book, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. I just. Well, the problem is in all these cases that their loyalty is still to the industrial system and to and it's not to the natural world. And so long as your loyalty is to this, that system and not to the natural communities, your solutions that you're trying for, whether they are, whether you can reach them or not, but even the ones you try for are not going to be. Real solutions real, because they're not going to help. They're not going to help the polar bear. She's very clear on what her priorities are. Um, if you don't help the polar bears, if you don't help, help the salmon, if you don't help, you know, all the other living creatures, we are going to also go down with them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't and we don't live in a bubble. We need the, those other creatures. Well, but see, that's the thing is these other people still live in this, this thought bubble that says that industrial capitalism, industrial civilization is where your food comes from. It's not from the living planet. Right. And when you when your experience is that your food comes from the system, again, that's what you're going to defend. And they need that's to most people's experience. Yes. So many indigenous people have said to me that the first and most important thing we have to do is to decolonize our hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. And part of that decolonization is recognizing that the dominant culture is killing the planet and finding a different way to fuel this destruction is not particularly helpful. Oh, here, I want to read you something that I wrote in the book that I'm really pleased with. Yes, and yes, I, do, do, do. I'd love it. I'm using quotes from a bunch of, uh, um, these are, uh, there are a whole bunch of so-called environmentalists who, uh, who say all sorts of things like the world doesn't need saving instead, uh, instead, uh, you know, what needs saving is civilization. They say this very explicitly. So, uh, let's say your community has been invaded by a terrifying occupier. It doesn't matter who the occupier is. 
It could be anyone from the Romans to Imperial British to Nazis to capitals to space aliens. These conquerors install a violent and exploitative extractive economy. Sorry for the redundancy, all extractive economies are violently exploited. They perceive you and everyone else in your community as inferior to them, of less value. Indeed, none of you have any inherent value whatsoever, but are valued only to the degree that you're useful to the occupiers. The most crass occupiers place value on you only insofar as they can convert you directly to cash. That would be like a fur trapper who only cares about bobcats in terms of how much money they make him, or a logger who only cares about how much money the, the, the trees or dollars on the stump. If they value your labor, they'll enslave you or pay whomever owns you for this labor. If you have no value to them as a laborer, they'll put monetary values on other ways they can use you. Can they sell your flesh for food? Can your skin be made into jackets? Can your fat be made into soap? Can your teeth be carved into trinkets? Your bones be made into fertilizer? Can your body be used for housing? Can you be burned or otherwise exploited for fuel? Each of those add value. And those values are determined by the overlords, not by you, not by those you love, not by those who love you, not by other members of your community. And why would you put a financial value on yourself anyway? If you're a sociopath, would you put a financial value on any other member of your community? For how many pieces of silver would you sell your mother? The slightly more sophisticated of the occupiers recognize it's possible for you to serve them in ways that can't be immediately monetized. For example, if your poop fertilizes the soil they use to grow their crops, they'll tolerate you on their agricultural field so long as you only poop, but do not eat or otherwise interfere with their cash crops. These more sophisticated occupiers attempt to put dollar values on your, quote, ecosystem services, end quote. Because the occupiers are inflicting extractive economy on your community, your community begins to crumble. In fact, your community crumbles so much it interferes with the occupier's ability to exploit, interferes with the occupier's economy. At that point, a few of the occupiers begin to grow concerned, not for your health or the health of your community, of course, because your health and the health of your community never seem to do it for the occupiers, but for the potential failure of their occupation. Some insist the only way to save your community in order to preserve their economy is to become ever more obsessed with putting a dollar value on every way they can think of that your existence serves their occupation. Others come up with plans A through D to mobilize to save the occupation and say things like, we talk about saving the community of subhumans we've conquered and enslaved. Those of us working on taking care of the subhuman community have been talking about the need to save subhumans for some time. But the subhumans are going to be around for a while. The question is, can we save the occupation? That's what's at stake now. I don't think we've yet realized it. These are all direct quotes from environmentalists, so-called environment, bright green environmentalists, with, I changed words like put in subhumans instead of nature. Oh, the, wow. The chief scientist at the Subhuman Conservancy, that's the Nature Conservancy, states, instead of pursuing the protection of subhumans for subhumans' sake, a new conservation should, she, should seek to enhance those processes of the subhumans that benefit the widest number of occupiers. Conservation will measure its achievement in large part by its relevance to occupiers. What he actually said was, instead of pursuing the protection of, of nature for nature's sake, a new conservation should seek to enhance these processes of nature that benefit the widest number of humans. Conservation will measure its achievement in large part by its relevance to humans. So I'm not going to go through the rest of them. You can see what I do with these. Yes, but I really hope people buy your book when it comes out because... Uh, and when it does, as soon as it's available, please, please, please let me know so I can push the hell out of this book. It's so timely. And that's why we've, we've done this series of videos. And there's, this is the third, the third video on this topic of his, his book that's going to be coming out, Bright Green Lies. And it, it's so timely with what's going on right now. And I just don't want, I don't want the world to make a mistake jumping on a, on a on the bandwagon um of a simple easy answer when it's not that simple and easy anymore and and just understand what what corporations are doing for instance this is something just blew me away a couple days ago there was an advertisement that came on it was for an exercise equip piece of equipment that had you know a video that you could like virtually be somewhere else and it was talking about how wild the wildlands are going extinct so you can so you know you can just do it your exercise here and still see all that have a virtual experience i was blown oh wait i was so mad that i skipped the ad and then i'm like oh my god i should have found that ad and 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 recorded it or something so i could show it because that would blew me away and that's what they're 
corporations, they will try to profit till their dying breath, their last dying breath. They're still going to try to profit, right? The, 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 the last thing the capitalists are going to say is, damn, we could have we could have gotten a little bit more money out of it first. You know, I don't know if we talked about this before, too, but there was this terrible, terrible, horrible, sexist movie in the 70s called, I think it's a boy and his dog, it might be a dog and his boy, I don't remember which, written by Harlan Ellison. And it's about a post-apocalyptic future where there are very few women. And when men, when a man finds a, when any group of gang of men finds a woman, they, they rape her to death. It's, That's horrible. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, uh, the point is there's a line at the beginning of the movie, near the beginning of the movie that has struck me for just a perfect description of patriarchy, which is the main character comes across a woman who was raped to death and she's now dead. And he says, oh, that's a real shame. She probably had a couple uses left in her. And that for me is the essence of patriarchy that it will continue to exploit. And when it destroys those it's exploiting, when it kills those it's exploiting, the sorrow is not for the one who was killed. The sorrow is, oh, well, shoot, we can't exploit that one anymore. And that's exactly what all this stuff is when they say, that's exactly what the Green New Deal is about, is trying to find new ways to continue the exploitation of the planet. I, I tend to agree, and it's not a very popular opinion, I have to say. Well, um, uh, <laughs> I know. Apart from which, there's a great line by Hudson um, Sinclair. It's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. Right. And yes. Likewise, it's hard to make an entire culture of people understand something when their entitlement depends on them not understanding it. Understanding it. I mean, this culture. The reason that most of us are going along, most of us understand. It does. It's not cognitively challenging to figure out that. If you have 8 million people living in one place, the food has to come from somewhere. That's not hard to figure out. And I mean, I, I think I mentioned before that my introduction to environmentalism was really in second grade when they put in a subdivision next to where I live and all the meadow larks were gone, all the, the, the cottonwood trees and all the, the garter snakes and anthills and grasshoppers. And I thought as a second grader, they can't keep doing this forever or they'll run out of room and where are these others going to live? My point is I understood in second grade, I didn't have the language for it, but I understood in second grade when I'm seven years old that you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. This is not challenging stuff. No, it's not. The reason that we don't understand it is because we don't want to lose access to ice cream 24-7. We don't want to lose access to, to really convenient food that we don't have to grow ourselves. We don't, yeah. I mean, there's so many things, water that comes out of our top. I just read this thing the other day, uh, maybe a couple months ago, that um, there was a study of young people in the United Kingdom. They were asked whether Wi-Fi access or sunlight is more important to them. And they said Wi-Fi access. Yep. It's not. <laughs> That's it's crazy. Not. And... I don't see, see, here's another way to put all this, is if salmon could take on human manifestation, what would they do? If the starving polar bears could take on human manifestation, would they be lobbying for industrial wind? Would bats be, in, we be arguing for industrial wind? No, they would be arguing and they would be enacting, taking down this whole system. Because this system has been killing the planet for 6,000 years. I said this before, I'm sure. But the first red myth of Western civilization is Gilgamesh deforesting Iraq. But Iraq, prior to the beginnings of this culture, was a cedar forest so thick that sunlight never touched the ground. That's not what Iraq is anymore. The Near East was heavily forested. Greece was heavily forested. I got a note from somebody, oh gosh, probably about a year ago, who lives in... Uh, I don't know if we remember which, but one of the islands in the Mediterranean. And this person said, you know, I only realized maybe six months or a year ago that these islands aren't supposed to be rocky, that they were originally covered with forest. 
and all of these rocks were where they're supposed to be, which is deep under the soil. Greek philosophers 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, however long ago, were complaining that deforestation was harming water quality. They were complaining about that 2,500 years ago. The deforestation was causing springs to disappear. And, and yeah, they still do it. And yeah, and we're still we're still doing it. Why are we doing it? Because it brings us access to ice cream 24-7. It makes it so we can continue this way of life that is becoming ever more... Uh, destructive energy and ever more destructive <laughs> the rate of destruction is increasing it's ever more destructive and it's ever more energy intensive did we talk before about jevons paradox too right yes okay great but go I ahead you can you can refresh that and then i would like to get to some comments i don't know how much time you have you can go as long as you want honestly well, let's like do another like 20 minutes um okay. jevons paradox very quickly was that this uh, Jevons was an economist in the 19th century who realized that increased efficiency in the use of coal did not lead to a decrease in the use of coal like you'd think it would, but instead to an increase in the use of coal, you'd think it would lead to a decrease because if you can, if you can heat your dinner using half as much coal, great, you're going to use half as much coal. But the thing is they found more uses for it because it was more economical. And this has been true of ed every energy source that's been brought online merely adds to the ones before. There was a guy who got mad at me for saying this a couple of weeks ago. Um, he, I said, you know, that this is true, that, that there is more wood used for fuel today than there was prior to the beginnings of the oil age. Every source, when they added hydro to the mix, it didn't decrease the use of the others. It merely added more. We have, I mean, there are, there are server, server farms now that use tremendous amounts of, of energy. There are marijuana farms that use tremendous amounts of energy. There are Bitcoin mining uses tremendous amounts. It's like all of these things are just, they weren't used for energy before. Everyone adds on. So this guy said, no, that's not true. Nuclear power in France replaced oil. And the example he gave me, or the, 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 the statistic he gave me to show that supposedly was that a higher percentage of nuclear, a higher percentage of French energy comes from nuclear power now than in 1960. <laughs> but notice that he said percentage. Yeah, but, because the, it hasn't reduced any. It's just. <laughs> so yeah, nuclear. I don't remember the numbers. I'm making up the numbers. So nuclear used to do 10 percent. Now it does 20 percent. Whatever. But 10 percent, 20 percent. So, so the, the rest of the energy went from 90% to 80%, but 80% of a number that's three times bigger is way more energy than 90% of a smaller number. And the same is true with solar and wind, right? Absolutely. I mean, where have they cut the fossil only, use? The only thing that has decreased energy use has been recession. Duh. Right. Yes. Okay, uh, so let's do some questions. Okay, awesome. Fantastic. Are you got, I'll just start with comments. And then I know there was somebody who had a really, he wanted to know if he read a book. I'm going to see if I can find it because uh, I didn't see him. You never read? <laughs> no, you never read a book. Where did he go? It, let's see. He, he said he sent his book. It's S-E-M-I-H. O G U Z C A N. I haven't had a chance. Okay, hasn't read it yet. Okay. Anyway, um, he, he says, Hi, Christine. Can you ask Derek if he read my book, Life is Cold? So he hasn't had a chance. I already asked about ultimate connections and what to do about our future. Um, yeah. Well, maybe one day if he gets a chance to read it, he can give us comments about it. So that'd be great. Um, yeah, been really crazy. Uh, one of my dogs just had surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, oh, God, I understand. And yeah, and your health isn't at, at its best. Crap. So I've heard that. Okay. All right. We already read that one. I, was, I know it takes a minute to put up. So Julie Love, thanks for stopping by. And going south is, is from Greenland and Norway, and he's tough. But I don't think he's sexist, really. I hope not. Um Anita, welcome. <laughs> Men should just stop. 
Okay. I'm really looking for some questions for Derek, people. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay. Um, I can't pronounce his name, but the one with the books. Okay. Thank you for, for asking. So, and thank you for answering. Um, Sandy and the ladies here are not gold diggers, but in general, dating scene, a lot of gold diggers out there. Yeah, there are. But okay, you guys really? Okay, if they're not going to ask any questions, then. Why would somebody ask, say something about gold diggers in response to anything I said? I know. Is that, Are you kidding me? That's all, the best you got? All right. Yeah. I'm sorry, but this women, man thing that you got going on in the chat. I don't understand. I really, really don't. That wasn't the point of this whole conversation. I guess they, they got stuck on the patriarchal thing, you know, but it's kind of true. We have a patriarchal society that doesn't, that doesn't have anything to do with the man individuals. Really? Does it? I mean, do you want to have a, do you want to say something about that? Like, because you are a super, like, supporter of women and their rights um no not particularly i i i want to talk about the stuff we talked about yeah i would rather talk about that as well thank you it's not actually that difficult to stay on topic it really shouldn't be but there but apparently let's go back and see if there's anybody who's on topic okay Sandy from Environmental Coffee House, thank you for being on topic. She says the more efficient, the more you use. Yes, that's a fact. Um, yeah, a great example of that. I don't remember if I did this before, but in the book, uh, Max was the one who came up with this thought experiment that which is actually better for the planet, a car that gets 100 miles per gallon or a car that gets one mile per gallon. And it would seem like a car that gets 100 miles per gallon would be better but it ends up not because if your car only got one mile per gallon, you would actually use less gas because it's, it would be three miles every gallon. A great example of that is the other day I went to this taqueria that's about five miles from here and got three tacos and I drove 10 miles and the car gets, let's say 40 miles a gallon. So I used a quarter gallon. So it cost me 80 cents to drive. And if I got one mile per gallon, that would have been 10 gallons, which would have been 40 bucks, 30 bucks. And I'm not going to pay an extra 30 or 40 bucks for those tacos, no matter how good they are. And that's just one example. It would make it so, so efficiency, it's Kevin's paradox again. Efficiency just uh, can drive consumption. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I don't drive a truck that gets 10 miles a gallon out there. You know, it just sits. That's all it does. It sits unless I absolutely need it. And if you have something that gets 40 to the gallon, you'll probably drive it more, I guess. I mean, I don't like going anywhere anyway, so I'm a bad example. But Chris Foster, thank you for being on topic. Could we utilize existing resources such as the overproduction of cars to create micro generation hubs? Um, every cell on my body wishes that, okay, I'm going to back up. I am fundamentally a conservative by which I don't mean I agree with conservative policies as such, but I, I think it's really stupid to wipe out the salmon when people might want to eat them in a hundred years. And yeah, salmon deserve to live for their own self too. And for the forest, but I also just think it's really stupid to to destroy something that could be useful in the future. And if I were in charge of the entire economy, I would use some oil and gas to do things like help set up these local economies. And I would use it to take down dams, et cetera, and use it to help us to help reforest and to help take out existing roads. And so, yes, I wish that that would happen, but I don't believe it will because of everything we've talked about the last three times. And, and mm -hmm. especially including the fact that this culture is pretty crazy. And that would make rational sense 
to turn resources away from those uh, purely destructive ends and toward things that would help us transition to a different way of life. Yes, I wish that would happen. But, you know, a great example of this, I love sports. I love, when I was younger, I loved participating. I still love watching them. But it breaks my heart to see 100,000 people at an LSU Tigers game when not 100,000 people care about real Tigers. My point is that, that we're using things for all the wrong reasons, and we're going to continue to. But that doesn't alter the fact that what you said is completely sane and desirable, and yes, and it's not going to happen. Right, yeah. But yeah. I agree. Okay, Jilly says, why do people knowingly support the very corporations and foods that are killing them? Thank you, Jilly, for being on topic. <laughs> um, I think it's really hard because, like I said, the system keeps inserting itself between us and that's another great question. The system keeps inserting itself between us and the real world. And in the town where I live, you know, Walmart came in and immediately most of the other grocery stores went out of business within like a year or two. And it drove a local computer repair guy out of business because, you know, they could sell computers cheaper than he could repair them. And that's part of the logic of capitalism is to um, okay, I hate it that you go to the grocery store and you have a choice between paying, I don't know, 60 cents or a buck, buck 50, buck and a quarter for a cucumber, or you can buy an organic cucumber for a buck 50 to two bucks, a buck to two bucks. It's, it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. and so we are socially rewarded for participating. We're socially rewarded by buying stuff at Walmart. We're socially rewarded for buying the non-organic products. It's, um, and yes, we can individually make choices that are better, but as a, as a society, the lower price will attract people. That's one part. And then there's also addiction that, okay, I don't, uh, I'm not as bad as I could be, but I really like potato chips. And I know potato chips are really bad for you on every level. I still find myself grabbing a handful, you know, I mean, they're, they're I'm the same way. <laughs> I admit it. And, and it's a guilty it, pleasure. It's, uh, so, and, and, and there, the, it, it is not, yes, it is, it is my fault for being too weak willed to not eat the potato chips, but, but remember the ad campaign, bet you can't eat just one, that these yeah. things, including McDonald's, et cetera, are set up to be addictive. And I'm, I don't have a huge addiction to sugar. My addiction would be more like to potatoes, which end up converting to sugar really quickly. Um, but, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm merely replicating what somebody else said. I'm not, I don't know this, so I could be lying. And I, I, it's very important to me to be truthful. But I've heard this multiple places, but don't take my word for it. Look it up yourself, as I've not yet done. But some people say that sugar is more addictive than like cocaine. I've heard that as well. I, I, I really have. I don't know if it's true. I don't know either. We have these addictions. Screen time. Screen time. Um, oh, what's his name? There's a really good video out about this called Stare Into the Lights, My Pretties, about what screens do to our brains and how screen time can be really addictive and how it can be terribly addictive to get those likes on Facebook, to check email. Oh my God, I got another email. You know, it used to be that it was really exciting when I was a kid to go down to the, to the mailbox to see, did I get mail? 
today? Did somebody in the family get mail today? This is exciting. And now you can do it. I can check and I can check and I can check. And then it becomes annoying and you don't appreciate it anymore. There's that too. <laughs> well, and then the phone call. Yeah. Do you need to get that? Yeah. Hold on just a sec. I'll see if I need to get rid of them or not. Ugh. Okay. All right. So guys, I really want to ask um, the question about, oh, where was it? There was a question on veganism and what Derek's thoughts are on that. Um, I He's not a vegan. So asking him about the dog food and all that is not probably going to work. Okay. <laughs> so important. Okay. So let's do, let's do two more questions. Okay. So I really wanted to, uh, the, your opinion on veganism, I get a lot of people asking me if that will save, you know, or, or saying that that will save the planet if everyone just becomes vegan. So I want your opinion on veganism. And yeah, my regular co-host who's also with the chat is a vegan as well. So just, I'm not, but just your, your um, opinion. First, no matter whom you're eating, you're eating someone. And I don't believe in the great chain of being that puts God at the top and then um, moves down through humans and then non-humans and then uh, plants and then rocks and then sand, basically. And I think plants are every bit as sentient as humans and squirrels are every bit as sentient as humans, probably smarter because they're not killing the planet. And so first, on that level, okay, and I also need to say factory farming is is an abomination yes. um, and should be eradicated through any means necessary. And agree. Um, okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that that I grew up in the country and um, agriculture for crops. Uh, is incredibly destructive of uh, non-humans as well. That when you turn over soil, you are uh, you are converting, you're, you're destroying dysbiotic cleansing. You're destroying the land down to the level of bacteria. And so it's it's not true that a diet of grains is not destructive. And I, the question always is what, the bottom line for me is always soil. And because it's like that old line about if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Mm -hmm. If the soil isn't happy, none of the rest of the natural community is happy. Right. Then you can't have the bugs, you can't have the plants, you can't have the people that eat the plants. And So the question is, um, what did that food, what did, what, what did the, the food you eat, did it add to the health of the soil? And did it help, did it add to the health of the land? So, for example, when there are an infinite number of salmon, I don't think it would be a good thing for me to eat a coho salmon from the stream right down here because coho salmon are highly endangered and there's not enough of them. Mm -hmm. an infinite number of salmon, and then you eat the salmon, and then you poop out in the forest as humans did, as bears did, as eagles did, then that's actually helping the forest by moving the nutrients around. If you... There are very few, at this point, given the destructiveness of this culture, there are very few ways of feeding ourselves that are, uh, that improve the soil. I can tell you one way, and don't know, the, the, the vegans will have a problem because an animal, may have a problem because an animal dies, but here's a way that someone could feed themselves that would actually benefit the land, which is to poach cows off of public land. 
Um, well, the vegans want to eliminate beef, and and that whole that whole um, I don't know that whole commodity, that whole product, like get rid of it altogether. So. I don't, I, I don't know if that would be, <laughs> I mean, well, there's so many contradictions and everything. It's like, what do you do with all the cows if suddenly everyone had to be vegan? Well, here's, here's the point is that even eating meat, I think that there are ways. I did an interview with this guy a few years ago about there are a few species of Asian carp who idiots put them in fish farms along the Mississippi and there was a flood and they got into the Mississippi and these invasive carp are wrecking havoc on the Mississippi river. The mm -hmm. only good news here is that I'm rolling my eyes at the notion of good news is that these carp actually taste really good. And that, and this is not just for, for animals. I, I would say the same for a lot of invasive plants that if they taste good, that's a great thing. Um, so eat invasive species. The important thing here is, is for me, is that uh, is 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 the land in better shape. Right. Me too, because we are not one organism. We're all. I mean, we are one organism as a whole like the individual isn't as important as the whole thing in my eyes. Right. And the important thing is also, I actually don't care what anybody eats. I don't care much about personal purity. It's like my friend Lear Keith says that um, the task of an activist is not to navigate systems of oppressive power with as much personal integrity as possible, but instead to take down those systems of oppressive power. And so whether somebody drives a car doesn't matter to me. Whether they fly on an airplane doesn't matter to me. Whether they eat meat or eat vegan, eat anything, I don't care. Even if I'm, I mean, there, there are some things I wouldn't do, but I wouldn't do them. But the important thing is to take down the entire system. Mm -hmm. That's what needs to happen. Well, that nothing, nothing's going to change until that happens. Nothing's going to get better until that happens. Right. So uh, okay. that I think but, a lot of people are on the same page there. So okay, one last question, then I got to go. Okay, yeah, we got to go to uh, Oz. Did you find any questions? It's hard when people are talking amongst themselves. Okay, well that's fine. Yeah, that's good. We'll we'll leave it there, guys. Um, thank you so much for your for the questions that were on topic. Love you guys. Uh, thank you so much, Derek. It's always a pleasure. By the way, Sam Mitchell from Collapse Chronicles says, "Hey, um, he's looking forward to getting you in an interview." Like. Yeah, me too. He's, he's awesome. This is a small community here. So anyway, thank you very much, you guys. Have a very good day. Thanks for showing up. And we will be back on Monday. So um, next week, we'll talk to you then. Oh, yeah, Friday. I think I have a thing Friday with Kevin Hester. I don't say that out loud. Um, anyway, thank you very much, Derek. I will be in touch. And okay. you too. We'll talk to you very, very soon. Thanks.